M1 Ultra is the next breakthrough for Apple Silicon. Take M1 Max and then, yeah, double it. 16 Firestorm performance cores, four Ice Storm efficiency cores, 32 neural engine cores, which, why aren't they called Brainstorm? Up to 64 G13 graphics cores, dual H.264 and HEVC decode engines, quad encode and ProRes engines, six USB controllers, six Thunderbolt controllers, and up to 128 gigabytes, 128 gigabytes of unified memory at 800 gigabytes per second for M1 Ultra. 70% of you watching still haven't subscribed, so hit that button and help us build the best community in tech together. We're adding one last chip to the M1 family, M1 Ultra. All of those cores, compute engines, silicon, are exactly the same as M1, which means A14 Bionic Generation IP just extended out for the Mac and then extended out again for Pro Max and Max Max. Same Ice Storm, same Firestorm, same Brainstorm. Yes, I'm doing it. Same G13, same media engine, same, 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 but at a scale just heretofore unimaginable. And that's the whole entire key, the whole entire trick, not just to M1 Ultra, but to Apple's silicon strategy writ large, truly scalable architecture, as in, Apple doesn't have to make or maintain different types or families of chipsets for different types or families of devices. They can use the same dual efficiency cores in the Apple Watch that they pair with performance cores in the iPhone and then multiply for the iPad and again like freaking triples for high-end Macs. Just extend the architecture by adding more and more cores and more and more features to bigger and more monolithic dies, at least until now. But Here's the thing, you can't just keep scaling that way, not without making an already massively monolithic die even more massively monolithic and risk all kinds of expense and yield rate issues. Even supposing TSMC's OG five nanometer process could accommodate it to begin with. The leading approach is to use two chips and connect them via the motherboard. However, that approach has significant trade-offs, including increased latency, reduced bandwidth, and much higher power consumption. So no, to keep scaling, you go multi-die, or at least in this specific case, you go dual die, two M1 Max dies merged together like Voltron into something very literally twice the size and twice the performance, all 114 B as in billion transistors worth. But instead of using fine LT and alchemy like Voltron, they're using what Apple calls ultra fusion because it turns out M1 Max had a secret. Not that it's always angry, that's the Hulk, but that it's always been meant to fuse. It has an ultra high speed interconnect right along one of its edges, an interconnect that can go through a silicon interposer to a second M1 Max, like two Lego bricks locking together with super glue. Only in this case, the lock is a 2.5 dimensional bridge that maps 10,000 signals and provides for up to 2.5 terabytes per second of bandwidth between those two dies. But the Apple alchemy here is that once dual M1 Max fuses into M1 Ultra, they don't present as dual M1 Max anymore, as dual dies at all anymore. They present as a single unified SOC, just with double the capabilities, which is ridiculous in oh so many ways. Like, yes, we now have a chip with dual image signal processors, dual ISPs in a Mac Studio, which has not a single camera, but also a double the power draw, fully lit up. If you can find a workload that actually lights up all those cores, other than Chrome tabs or Electron apps, of course. And yes, each single core is still the same as M1, as A14, which is a generation old already, and it'll be two generations old by the time A16 ships this fall. So core for core, feature for feature, the story really doesn't change here, not at all. But for multi-core, for the sum total of features, most especially GPU, Apple has just rewritten the whole damn book because any core from any die can access any of the eight RAM modules on either die with latency so low as to be indistinguishable at the software level. And similarly, the GPU cores on both dies aren't treated as two separate GPU devices, which would leave them subject to developer implementation or lack thereof, and essentially doomed for use on separate tasks. They're treated as one single GPU, one single metal device. So developers have to do nothing, literally nothing other than support Apple's metal frameworks, which have now been around for basically ever in API time. 
And all of that power can be instantly brought to bear all on the same task, which if it pans out the way that Apple's hyping it will, is just breathtaking. We're talking Keanu levels of breathtaking. It's something that merchant silicon vendors have been chasing, striving for, for years. And Apple just mic dropped it right now, today, seemingly out of nowhere, but realistically out of nearly a decade of relentless obsessive silicon iteration and integration from the A7 on up. And now, yes, all my silicon nerd max excite notwithstanding, all the usual caveats about having to wait and see actual real world performance in the actual real world, absolutely. Because there's a lot we still have to test and see. Like while Apple is claiming the raw GPU perf exceeds even an NVIDIA GeForce RTX 3090, the current god emperor of graphics cards, and at 100 watts, not the 300 watts the 3090 draws, which is why you can fit M1 Ultra into a Mac Studio sized enclosure when like just Alder Lake, just the Alder Lake CPU by itself would require liquid cooling to fit into something 10 times that size. But at the end of the day, it's all still an apples to bananas comparison because people who want Nvidia want Nvidia. They want CUDA cores. They want that gaming compatibility. They want ray tracing now, even if it takes a card the size of a freaking shield helicarrier to get it. And having all of that, having any of that available on Apple Silicon, even a truly monstrous 64 GPU Apple Silicon is still gonna take a long while. So just keep telling yourself, this is still gen one of the transition and then keep pushing Apple and literally every single developer you love for more and better and faster on the GPU front. Same with memory because 128 gigabytes of unified memory is just as ridiculous. But the iMac Pro that the Mac Studio seems to be replacing eventually went up to 256 gigabytes of RAM and that was for the CPU. The GPU though topped out at 16 gigabytes. So 128 gigabytes of RAM for the GPU at 800 gigabytes per second to keep it all not just fed, but positively gluttoned is something we've just never seen before either. And that's not to say the CPUs aren't also really, really interesting because previously with Pro Max, going massively multi-core also meant going Xeon, which with Intel were always generations behind on IP and significantly clocked down on a per core basis, just always, forever. Which is why the i9 non-pro iMac just crushed the Xeon Pro iMac on single core. Power efficiency affects the entire system, including enclosure design, thermals, acoustics, and ultimately performance. With M1 Ultra, all the cores are all clocked the same as M1 Pro and M1 Max, all full speed. And in the MacBook Pro, where as more cores engaged, the total clock would go down, it'll be interesting to see what happens in the much bigger, much better cooled thermal enclosure of the Mac Studio, especially since M1 Max cores are already in dual clusters. So one core can be full speed in one cluster, even if the other cluster has multiple cores active and down clocked, only now, you guessed it, there are double the dual clusters as well. And double the neural engines, which is also something we've never seen before from Apple. They went to 16 a &E cores with the A14 and promptly stayed there, not just for the A15, but for the M1, M1 Pro, M1 Max as well. One of the very few things Apple just never scaled out until now. Because with dual die, we're getting 32 a &E cores, double AMX accelerators too. And what that means for really gnarly machine learning workloads, I'm talking beyond what it would take for even an ILM deep fake to seem less deeply fake. Likewise, double the media engines, which means things like up to a staggering 18 simultaneous streams of 8K ProRes video, basically a multiverse of madness amount of ProRes video, like having a dedicated render box strapped to the side of your Mac, but with zero latency for when you need to rope in things like the GPU or A&E for effects as well, which given how fast all of that is already on the M1 Max, is gonna feel like damn near flux capacitor fast, like near instantaneous. And of course, double the IO controllers, three USB and three Thunderbolt, which means support for way more ports, especially those high speed ports the ones needed to drive pro peripherals and displays, the ones that we've all been asking a couple of years for now. And yes, I get it, I feel it. 
All of this does prompt the question, maybe the M1 ultimate question, is dual die as far as Apple will go? Because on one hand, Apple did just say, we're adding one last chip to the M1 family. But on the other hand, we've had reports of a quad die variant for a while now as well. With just one more product to go, Mac Pro. And I have some ideas, so many ideas. So hit the like button and let me know in the comments if you wanna see that in a future video as well. Then to get more, just way more out of all of this and maybe even get involved in making the next generation of this, check out the algorithms, neural networks, and machine learning courses on today's sponsor, Brilliant. Basically everything that the next generation of everything from silicon to software is going to be built on, but also math, science, and computer science, physics, quantum mechanics, game theory, so much more. Because Brilliant is the online, interactive STEM learning platform with a growing catalog of courses specifically crafted to help you learn concepts by working through them yourself in visual, hands-on ways. And all the lessons are thoughtfully broken up into bite-sized pieces so you can learn at your own pace, no pressure. Like, have you ever wanted to learn code, but you were put off by overly complicated traditional computer programming courses? Well, Brilliant has actual fun, interactive challenges that let you shift blocks of pseudocode around, receive immediate feedback and get results. You feel like you're solving puzzles, gaming even, but the whole entire time you're learning how algorithms work. And once you know that, coding becomes way less intimidating and way more accessible. There's also a brand new everyday math course that provides even more foundational math lessons to help even more people get started. Because here's the thing, Everyone, absolutely everyone starts somewhere and you can get started right now, today, for free. Just visit brilliant.org slash Renee Ritchie or click the link in the description. And the first 200 of you will get 20% off Brilliant's annual premium subscription. So click that button on the screen or go to brilliant.org slash Renee Ritchie. Clicking on that button really helps out this channel and so does hitting up this playlist for even more Apple event coverage, all the details, all the inside info, all for you. So hit up this playlist and I'll see you in the next video.